work identity. I'm not sure if your career identity is different from your work identity. I think mine is. Um, and so that's what we're about. We're going to hear from each of the panel speakers with a very short talk and maybe a chance for a comment or two. And then you're going to have a chance to talk amongst yourselves for quite a while and then come back to a community debate. We thought that would be keep you awake better than, than just a sort of very long plenary. Um, if you speak at any point, thank you. <laughs> um, Jane is around. Where's Jane gone? She's she has a mic clutched in her hand. And it's helpful if you say who you are when you say something. And if you if you want to stand and if you uh, if you can wait for the mic, it probably helps. I found during the day people don't always hear well in this room. Right. Um, so I'll introduce people as we go. It's so distracting, isn't it? So here we are. This is our lovely panel. So we have Stephen, Jenny, Sharon, and Nathan, and they're all here, which is something of a relief. Um, these are the sorts of things we thought we might spend a little while on this late afternoon. So, you know, how do we see ourselves? How are we seen by others? Which has kind of been a theme all day, I think. How do we shape our learning and work? But also, how does it shape us? You know, how does what we do affect our identity? Uh, I found this little diagram. Have you seen that one before? This is called the power flower, and I came across it the other day, being used not for career purposes at all in a, in a big development charity. And so this is used in development work to help people compare their identities in the middle of the flower. I'm a Guatemalan, I'm a woman, I'm age 47. The white circle around the outside are the characteristics of people in power. It's a very interesting analysis, it actually comes from Canada. So I think that all those issues about who we are in relation to others are sort of nicely expressed. I thought social media gives us a whole new window on how people choose to characterise themselves. This is my daughter's Twitter thing. Um, surfer, lecturer, biochemist, gig rower, for those who don't know what gig rowing is, it's crazy racing rowing on the sea. So this is a girl who has chosen to live by the sea in a way to be a biochemist. She's a cox, that means she's the very small woman who shouts at the six extremely large men rowing the boat. She gets that from her mother, of course. <laughs> Cyclist, and so on. And I think this sort of juxtaposition of personal and work identity is is probably very normal now, people seeing themselves in those ways. This is a woman I'm working with at the moment. She's sitting on a mountain in Haiti. She's an international development worker, very specialised person. And this is her family. So married to a man from Haiti. Haiti has lived in Africa for many years. Those are her three rather beautiful sons. In her family, they discuss whether they're African, whether she's white. Her sons have recently said, we see you as black, mama. Because the way they define that is to do with living in Africa, to working with people with certain issues in their lives, fighting the good fight. They've chosen that word for that set of identities. And I only found out the other day, this is the life she leads, her job is in Woking, but she lives in Guinea. <laughs> and she commutes once or twice a month from Africa to Surrey. I mean, it's pretty, and our identities are very interesting these days. So this is the stuff, this is the stuff of the lives we now live. Okay, so we're going to have four very different takes on identity, starting with Stephen McNair. So you can't fit Stephen on a card, really. Stephen has worked for a long time around the issues of education and work and career and age. So an interesting 
journey. Uh, Stephen has invented more public policies on education than anyone I know and lived to see them succeed, fail and then be reinvented. So over to you, Stephen. <laughs> minutes is a terrifying time scale to do anything sensible in. So I, I wonder if that's just reading out the slide to me. I haven't done anything clever. There's no pictures. There's no revealing things in clever ways. It's just all there. Those are the things I'm going to talk about. But I thought to start talking about identity, uh, I really ought to start by saying something about my identity. At the age of 16, coming from a family of teachers, I said, the one thing I'm never going to do is to work in education. I have absolutely nothing to do with education. Uh, 57 years later, I'm a retired professor of education. <laughs> last week I did my, probably my last day of paid employment in the education business, um, and I am now thinking about what I do next. Somewhere in my late 50s, I thought about, it, it was time to start thinking about what I was going to do with the next 20, 30 years of my life, as people do around that stage of their lives. Uh, and since I was the head of the university department, I had the power to set up a research centre and investigate this question, which was, quite, <laughs> which was a good way of thinking about how I was going to manage my retirement. Uh, in due course, the Vice-Chancellor announced that he thought my research centre wasn't going to earn its keep any longer and would I like to take early retirement? <laughs> so I did. But we researched, the, the reason one begins to think at that stage of life, of course, is that parents and, uh, parents and colleagues begin to retire mentors begin to die and you begin to think there is an end to this process somewhere which you have to start thinking about. So we set up a research centre and it was partly because in the southeast of England we had a real problem, we have skill shortages, labour shortages, there aren't enough people of working age to do all the work that needs to be done, we don't want to build any more houses, the transport system is completely clogged and we don't like immigrants. So actually the, the only solution to this problem is to keep people in work longer. So the question was, how do we do that? And that's why the Regional Development Agency gave us some money to do that. Uh, and we started looking at this question. We're, we're an ageing society because we're living longer. Life expectancy has been rising consistently, the data is quite clear, since 1840, uh, with two blips, the First World War and the Second World War. And recently I found a fascinating piece of research into the life expectancy of the European nobility somebody who has traced 115,000 members of the European nobility back to the 13th century and has mapped the increase in life expectancy across the whole of that period. There are two other blips. One is the Battle of Agen, of course, which is the biggest slaughter of the nobility in Europe. And the other is 1550, when the aristocracy discovered how to get other people to die instead of them by the invention of artillery. So, life expectancy has been going up. Fertility rate has been static effectively since the 1960s. So we are all getting older. Uh, one of the things that this produces is a, a rethinking of the shape of the life force. And I worked for NIAS. We worked on national inquiry into the future of lifelong learning. We looked at the way people think about the shape of the life force. The traditional model, the three phases, childhood and adolescence, working life and retirement. And it was clear this didn't make any sense any longer. Partly adolescence actually goes on. The neuroscience now tells us that adolescence goes on until the mid-20s. Um, also, people are going on actively working in a whole variety of ways much later into life. So we proposed a four phase, a break somewhere around 25, somewhere around 50, and somewhere around 50, 75. Somewhere around 50 is a time when age discrimination begins to affect people in the labour market. So it's really important that around that time people think about what it is they want to do, how they want to do it, and what is possible. So we invented the idea of the Midlife Career Review. Uh, we persuaded an, an enthusiastic minister to do a project. Uh, we put 2,000 people through that project. It was extraordinarily successful, enormously positive feedback from the advisors, from the clients, from the employers. Everybody thought it was great. Uh, and then somehow it kind of dissolved in a variety of ways, though there are bits of it still going on in a variety of places. Uh, the really striking thing was that how many of the people who did that process said nobody ever cared. We didn't think anybody was interested in my career. I didn't think I had a career. Nobody's asked me about what I think about work since I left school. Extraordinary sense that, that <laughs> despite what all the people in this room think they're doing, most people don't seem to actually think about those, well, they think about questions. 
but they don't get a chance to talk to people about them until much later in life if they're extremely lucky or extremely rich, perhaps. Work defines a lot of the ways we think about our identity, about who we are, what, what, what life means. It's very important, but of course, retirement and extending working life begins to raise questions about meaning and where work fits. How important is it? If I fall out of work at the age of 35, I have to find another job because I've got to maintain my life. If I fall out of work at 55, the, it begins to be a possibility that I could say, now I'm going to stop working and do something quite different. What is that something? How would we approach that? So people begin to think differently about their identity in relation to work. Um, and of course, what work is, is an interesting concept. Um, Charles Handy used to write about this. You know, what is the difference between, uh, actually, feminists in the 60s were writing about it. What is the difference between the work that women do that nobody pays for and the work that men do that people do pay for? Um, there are all sorts of questions of that sort. My father was still working at the age of 93 on what I, in other circumstances, would have been two or three jobs that he could have been paid to do, which he was doing on a voluntary basis. So unpaid work and paid work interlock in interesting and complicated ways. And some work, of course, is disappearing. Uh, some work is moving from human to machine. Uh, and that raises questions about the way we organise society, which is why I put universal basic income in there, because some people think that is <coughs> the solution to changing the relationship between people's lives and work. There's a second strand, and I, I've no idea where I'm in my six minutes, but I, uh, I'm okay. Right, good. <laughs> in that case, the other strand that comes out of this is a question about community and identity, and who people think they are, and again, age raises its head. One of the really striking things, and I have become obsessively interested in the issue of the B word in the last year or so. I am vice chair of Norfolk for Europe. Uh, we are actively campaigning in ways that probably quite a number of people in this room agree about. Um, but one of the striking things about the European referendum was the divide by age, by age and by education. And often it's been described as a distinction in age. It was the old who voted to leave and the young who voted to remain. Actually, when you look at it, it's more complicated than that. It's actually to do with education. Education is, when you do the regression stuff, education is a more important factor. And the reason it correlates with age, of course, is the vast expansion of higher education during our, our adult lives. Uh, when I went to university, 4% of the school, school leavers went to university. Now it's getting on for 50 that transforms how people see the world, how people think about the world. But it's quite clear that there is a really powerful divide in identity. And it is about identity. It's not about, um, it seems to me, having argued with lots of people about Brexit, it's not about the facts, it's not about the economy, it's not about the trade relationships or whatever. It's about who I think I am and where I think I belong in the world. Who I am is the important question. Um, and that ties partly to questions about the city and the country. Uh, the migration of people from the country to the city. The migration of people in Europe from the east to the west. Uh, which goes with education. We educate young people. The brightest young people go to higher education. And then they go looking for the kind of jobs that go with higher education. Which they find in the cities rather than in the towns and the rural areas where they came from. I was interested by Charlie Ball's point this morning that actually a surprise, more graduates than you might expect go home again after they graduate and stay there from choice, not from necessity. And that is very interesting, but it's not a pattern across the whole of Europe, certainly. So we get this curious movement of educated, educated people from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, from country to city, uh, which is changing the nature of those communities and changing how people think about themselves and their identity and the notion of the somewheres and the nowheres in that infamous phrase. People who belong nowhere and people who belong somewhere. People for whom identity is fundamentally rooted in a particular geographical place, as distinct from people who, whose identity is rooted in a profession, an occupation, a peer group of some kind. So those seem to be interesting questions to think about. How does our understanding of the relationship between identity and work change as we age? And how does the relationship between identity and place change uh, as, again, as we age partly? Because what we have is aging rural communities, aging eastern communities, and young cities 
with increasingly different notions of what, what life is about, what identity is, what makes life important and worth living. I think that's actually a rather dangerous situation for us to be in, and I think politically. Uh, it is it's fairly awkward and not a terribly clever observation to say that we are a divided society and we don't know how to resolve this, but at some point we're going to have to do something about it. So I think those are questions to think about if we're thinking about identity. And now I'll shut up. <laughs>
have to think about occupational segregation, both horizontal and vertical, about gender pay gap, as I've already mentioned, about the relationship of women to the labour market uh, and their much higher proportion in part-time, flexible, uh, insecure, low-paid, low-status jobs. I mean, one, one can go on and I won't dwell on it. But I think, you know, having thought about that and gender as an indicator in the labour market, I think it's quite relevant for me to uh, highlight Siobhan's research that we were hearing about in the first session around the career's workforce. And her research reveals that 77% of career professionals in this country are women. She also put up some fairly shocking statistics about their pay rates. And in a sense, it's same old, same old. But labour market, I think, is a fairly powerful indicator about how we regard being male and being, being female. And I switch from that to practice, because not only is our profession predominantly female, but there are theories about women, specialist theories about women, that are not, in my experience, well understood or known about, or espoused by practitioners. So on the one hand, I have the complexity of women's position in society being uh, substantially different from that of men. And I'm not in any way arguing that men are not disadvantaged and have complexities, but in terms of scale. So women, I think, I would argue, I have always argued, require a particular approach from career support, uh, which I'm never sure that they get. Uh, and on the other hand, we have sets of theories in research which are more or less sidelined by our profession, and I'm always left wondering why that might be. I think the final point that I would make relates to professional identity. And Wendy has talked about, you know, sort of identity is not how, just how we see everybody else and how we feel about ourselves, but there is an issue, isn't there, about how we are perceived by other people. And certainly, I taught on a, a counselling course a couple of, one decade ago, and I was very struck that research had been done in the counselling field, which I could not find any equivalent for in the careers field, around clients' perceptions about the gender identity of their career professional. And it's an interesting one, because I've done research on evaluating the effectiveness of guidance. So this is a bit of a, a bit of an invisible factor, isn't it? Uh, because what the uh, careers research found was that when clients are asked what gender they would prefer uh, their client, their counsellor to be, predominantly the clients would say men if they knew that they wanted to discuss vocational, academic, social, or interpersonal issues that they would say women if they wanted to talk about just personal issues. And I kind of thought, well, if you're evaluating guidance and we're not even asking the question, you know, we're talking to clients about how effective they found their guidance intervention. <coughs> Do we ever ask the question about the identity of the counsellor or the practitioner that they worked with? And are there any organisations at all that can accommodate that, given that we are apparently 77% female? But I do think it's, um, it's quite challenging anyway for me to think about those sorts of issues at the same time as we're talking about trying to accommodate the particular needs of our, of our clients uh, and the customers, if we call them that. So I think gender actually represents a whole range of, of complexities that tend to remain pretty much blind in our profession. I'm not sure we necessarily confront them, or try to discuss them, or reflect upon them, or act upon them. Um, it's uh, a tricky issue, it's difficult. Uh, I always feel uh, sensitive about talking about gender, and one thing that I've noticed over the years is that when I have presented on my gender research at international conferences, I get a very, very poor attendance. The audiences are invariably women with an occasional token man. I'm not, you know, I'm not into bashing 
but I think it's a fact that it's not regarded as a mainstream issue or a problem uh, that as a field we necessarily ever try to engage with. And I guess I'm saying when I think about it that identity and gender is, is wider than It is such a huge issue that we just leave it to the side and try to ignore it and carry on. And I might have finished within my six minutes, but I have actually finished. <laughs> last week about medicine and about the way in which medical trials are all conducted on men and nobody asks are women different from men and it's a really interesting parallel it seems to me and similarly an extraordinary blindness that yeah. we had for since yeah. forever nice to hear a bloke say that isn't it <laughs> i have to say i work with one firm most hr people of course are women especially in learning and development and i work with a big engineering company where most of the workforce are male and a bit older than the women in, in l and and i was talking to them about their, that that had the support they got from that function and they said well they're all right but there are a load of young women and i'd really like to talk to a bloke sometimes so you know i think people very rarely are honest about their they're, they're sort of quite strong feelings about who they want to talk to about different things. Yes, we don't ask the question. No. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Thank you very much. who's worked in industry for much of her working life uh, in senior HR roles in big companies on things like talent management, which I work on myself, no one knows what that means, do they, Sharon? Uh, and career consulting also. She also runs a boutique company, I think that's so cool. I'd like to call my business boutique on gender diversity coaching and consulting. Um, and is here today to give us a perspective of what all this identity stuff looks like in the workplace and from an employer perspective um, which perhaps careers people that's not a perspective that dominates at careers events often thank you Sharon. thank you wendy so yes i'm going to be changing um, tack and talking about what it's like for employers and individuals in organizations employees and what are some of the, the factors and the pressures that are impacting how we perceive careers and also what that means for identity so, uh, and at the risk of kind of saying too obvious, I'm going to talk through some of the contexts that employers are facing at the moment. So obviously we're in a time of quite unprecedented change. With the fourth industrial revolution is upon us, we've got rising automation, artificial intelligence encroaching on jobs, taking away parts of jobs, in some cases taking away entire jobs, uh, which has implications for careers in organisations. So when jobs disappear, of course, the career paths that people might have aspired to suddenly change or in some cases disappear. It also has an implication for the skills that we need in the future. So obviously we know there are going to be different skills that we need in the future in businesses, individuals <coughs> need different skills, but we can't say with any certainty what those skills are. It's very, very difficult to predict what skills will be important. And of course, skills and the jobs that comprise those skills obviously form part, uh, part of careers and career paths. So, Again, there's a real challenge in organisations as to how they help employees to prepare for um, a career when the landscape is changing, when you know, the days of linear career planning are long gone. 
And so what we are seeing, and certainly encouraging when we work with organisations, is for them to think about and talk about career lattices rather than career ladders. So rather than climbing the rung of a career ladder and having a predictable set of jobs that you might move through, we encourage organisations to talk to their employees about um, using a career lattice, which means careers can grow in any direction, up, down, sideways, diagonally, it might mean a change of function, it might mean um, uh, changes of roles. Um, the other thing that's changing in organisations, of course, is structures. So as jobs change and disappear and skill sets change, the structure within the organisation has to adapt and, and change as well. So again, that has implications for careers. How do you plan a career when the structure and your, your boss's job suddenly disappears and so that role is no longer a role that you can aspire to or no longer a role that you can do? Um, the other thing that's going on, of course, is changing demographics. So, you know, Stephen talked about age, we're getting older, people are staying in the workforce longer, sometimes through choice and sometimes through financial necessity. Uh, it's becoming increasingly evident that individuals will have more than one career over the course of their work lives. So, for organisations, it's quite a challenge as to how we help individuals to plan for those careers. It's hard enough to help individuals plan for one career, let alone when there's going to be potentially a change of career for the individual. Some individuals will need to reskill, some individuals will find their jobs no longer or their um, vocations no longer exist, they're going to have to learn different skills. And so there's an obligation, I think, on organisations to help that, but not with any real visibility of what that might look like or when that might happen for different individuals. And then, of course, the other thing that's going on in, in the background is tightening of immigration, um, historically low unemployment levels uh, in this country. Um, and also, um, this is in the context of tightening labour markets. So we've got predictions that the labour market is going to be, uh, we're going to experience talent shortages, quite severe talent shortages in the next 10 years. So the prediction is that the population growth is going to outstrip the growth of the working age population. There just won't be enough people to go around, not just in this country, but further abroad as well. So, for those reasons, I really think that at the moment it is an employee's market as much as it is an employer's market. Um, I think there's pressure on employers to help employees to um, see what, what career opportunities there are. Um, but actually they're doing it in a very difficult situation, they're doing it without knowing what the landscape, landscape might look like. So one of the ways that employers can and are helping individuals to fight um, in this very competitive talent landscape is to offer career propositions, career deals, often as part of the um, employee value proposition or EVP as we would call it within the organisation. So we know that career development is consistently rated as one of the top attraction and retention drivers in organisations. So the reason employees choose to join an organisation can be the reason employees choose to leave an organisation if those needs aren't met. So it's becoming more and more important for employers to actually have a really strong career proposition and, a, and that's part of the EDP in order to get the best help and um, attract the best people. Um, so there are challenges for organisations here. How do, they, how do they balance all of this in a, um, in a changing world? But there's also challenges for employees. So I've got here a new psychological contract. It's not really new. The concept of careers for life is a, a long gone concept. There's no more sense of a linear, planable careers. I think we all know that. But I'm really struck when I work with organisations, how many employees still ask for that? So how many individuals still want some real certainty, not necessarily around the job for life, but some certainty around what is the sequence of roles that they might go through? What might a career path look like? Um, and that term comes up, career path. Um, so even though we as practitioners know that actually that's not something that organisations can offer, there's a real demand for that. And we're seeing it not just in my generation, Generation X and older generations, but really surprisingly we're seeing it in younger generations as well. So um, millennials and the Gen Zs that are in the workplace are asking for this and it kind of perplexes me. I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. Is it coming from their parents? Is it coming from school? Is it coming from the workplace when they get there? Do they suddenly 
think that this is something that's reasonable to demand. At the same time, the other thing that we're seeing is a greater demand for flexibility. So individuals are really asking for greater flexibility in how they work, what they do, where they work, who they work with, um, and so forth. And I think you know, the rise of the gig economy is partly associated with that, it's partly meeting that demand. Um, and it's giving employees options. So if they look around the organisation and think, well, actually, I don't really like how my career is shaping up here, they can actually choose to opt out and join the gig economy and do something a little bit different. So I think there are, there are greater options um, than ever before for employees. And I think what we're seeing is that reflected in a greater employee voice. I think actually employees can demand more, particularly in the tight labour market, they can ask for more. And the evidence for that that I'm seeing is in a number of organisations that are actually providing quite generous and quite groundbreaking flexibility arrangements. So the introduction of the four-day working week, which we're starting to see reported, um, really generous paternity and maternity leave policies that we've never seen before, and all the time I've been advocating for that, there's been an explosion of that recently with Diageo and Mobile and O2 and a whole bunch of companies offering paid paternity leave that mirrors maternity leave, for example. We're seeing the likes of Ernst & Young in Australia offering 12 weeks of life leave a year, which you can use to either adjust your hours or to travel the world or just to sit at home and have a break from yourself when you want. Um, so we're seeing more and more response, I think, to that employee voice. So I'm just going to finish now on kind of what all this means for identity, and it's more a provocation than an answer. So um, a couple of thoughts that occurred to me, and I'd be very interested in your comments on these. Um, at the risk of stating the blinding obvious, I think there is a real danger when individuals have their identity too closely associated with the work that they do. And we know that work is, is in an important part of our identity. But if we think about the changing nature of work, um, if we think about the fact that some individuals uh, are in jobs that won't exist in the future, some individuals are in jobs that will um, move to lower status in the future, think actuaries um, as parts of their job are automated, think journalists as bots increasingly start to um, replicate articles for different channels. So if individuals are going to either have to reskill or in jobs that are going to lose status, there's a real risk for them their identity is heavily vested in what they do. And I guess my question is how do we as career practitioners help individuals? How do we help them to navigate those changes in a positive way? And the other observation, uh, as an early observation, is I'm wondering whether there is starting to, we're starting to see a shift towards individuals identifying more with organisations and companies. There was a, a recent survey just this year by Mercer of over 7,000 respondents globally. And when they asked how individuals, who individuals associate with most, most people said their company. So their identity was heavily tied up with the organisation that they work for, more so than the profession that they do, which I thought was really interesting. Um, that's one study, it's one data point, I don't know what that means, but it, it does make me think are we seeing a shift with the rise of the social enterprise? Are we seeing a shift towards people wanting to be really closely aligned with organisations, wanting to work for organisations whose values are the same as theirs? Is this becoming an increasingly important part of our identity? And also with the rise of social media, the kind of generations, younger generations who've grown up living their lives much more publicly, how important is being associated with a inverted as good employer to their sense of self and their identity. I don't know the answer, but it's a, it's a provocation, and if anyone's done any research on that, I'd love to hear about it. It would be a really interesting area of research. All right, I'm going to finish up there. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Notice our balletic delivery here. We move around seamlessly. Right, last up, but by no means least, uh, I thought we ought to have token foreigner, you know, you kind of, <laughs> you have to, don't you? Um, Nathan has come from the States. He did a fascinating PhD in Seattle, and then he moved right down the coast and in a bit. I found out last night that's what you do to find Nathan. You, you go to Los Angeles and then you go in a bit. Um, to uh, the California Baptist University, is that correct? Um, where Nathan works with a very interesting student population, largely of Hispanic origin, where he's putting into practice his interest in the career development practices that individuals can use and how that links with how they feel about their work um, and also their sense of agency in their working lives. And I thought that would be an interesting angle for us this afternoon. So thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Can you hear me? No, that's not that mic. That's, that's not this that's one. Only that's only this right? one. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thumbs up. <laughs> Wonderful. So I have to notice my Russian friend left as the American came up. I don't know that, what that says about our country. Okay, so I'm Nathan Iverson, I'm from California Baptist University. Thank you for welcoming me here, and today I'm going to talk some about identity. So I'm a psychology professor, so of course I have to start with identity born versus made. And before we jump in, if I could have everyone take a breath and breathe out, you're looking a little oxygen depleted, I'm mean, you like, there we go. Give me a little wiggle so you can know I'm still, <laughs> you're still with me. Okay, identity is born. We come with a diversity of identities. I went to an incredible workshop, as you hear me say, a lovely workshop a couple weeks ago, and they had us, it was a race and social justice workshop, and they asked us to share about our identities in groups. So we went in our tables, we listed out our top three identities. Some of you have probably been in these kind of race and social justice workshops, and we wrote down our identities. Okay, so I wrote, you know, my, for me it was like American, male, and my faith. It was like three core parts of my identity. And then we shared, which part of those identities do you choose to withhold? I thought that was really interesting. And then that is a part of, like I didn't choose, you didn't choose what country you were born into, you didn't cho choose the, the sex you were born as, you did not cho choose the family or the income that your family had, you didn't choose your skin color. None of those were chosen. So a part of who we are, including a part of our intelligence, is born. And psychology was suggested there's kind of a yin and a yang there. It's, it's like half and half. And for us, so the people working with those, developing their careers, for me that creates a lot of hope. That if it's all born, then it's, it's on to me, like, oh God, I'm a victim of my life. However, that's, if that was the case, if that's the end of the story, none of you would have jobs. You're about, your job is creating hope for people, right? Helping them to imagine a better future, create potential. So I think that's a tremendously exciting part of our work. So I'm going to suggest that the yin and the yang here of career development, of our identity, uh, many psych psychologists are suggesting that behaviors, our behaviors inform identity. Am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Am I an intelligent person? Am I a high performer? Am I a cyclist? Am I, the list can go on. Many of our identities are informed by our behavior. So this is intentional for me and with my students, that as it's so shared, most of my students come from Mexican background, and my, my city is a majority uh, Hispanic. So as I look across our city government, it's a majority of people that look like me plus 40 years. And I'm like, it's hard for my students to look at our city and say, oh, I could be a CEO, or I could be a mayor. So then what we do is we, we assign experiences to them that they think they probably are not capable of achieving. Day one in our grad program, I say, you're a consultant. Find a client, add value to the organization. And many of them are freaked out. And they say, like, how could I do this? I don't do this. I don't. I say, you'll do it. We'll support you. At the end of the semester, their identity shifts. And they say, I'm a leader. I'm a person of potential. I can hold my own. I can stand with confidence when presenting with a group of people. Their identity shifts after they watch their behaviors. If our identity is in fact malleable, and that's what I would propose, it's like copper here that can be bent. And I think many of us, we start off and, you know, I come from a faith background, so I would say, you know, we are made with this intentional direction of purpose and calling. 
And then, many of us kind of get bent out of shape, right? Like, take on identities of various unhelpful things that say, I'm this, 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 A, B, C, therefore I can't do a X, Y, Z. Because people like me don't do that. For me, that was, I grew up on a farm in rural America. Like, people like me work with their hands, not their heads. I thought I was going to sweat to make my living my whole life. And it wasn't until someone spoke potential to me and said, Nathan, you're different. One of my professors, someone of perceived authority, spoke potential and said, Nathan, you're different. You ask different kinds of questions. Then I thought, oh my goodness. She said, you're going to be a teacher. And I thought, yeah, I'm, yeah, right. Now I'm a teacher. But I never thought I was smart enough for grad school, even though I was high in my classes because I was a farm kid. So, so it took someone to speak potential to me. Many of the people we serve and you serve are, come from backgrounds that have this oppression, that need kind of the chains to be broken off with verbal persuasion to say, yes, you are a person of potential. Yes, you can do great things. Yes, you're made with purpose. So if efficacy is malleable, yet we walk with oppression, this is an example of low self-efficacy. Albert Bandura, a famous psychologist, <coughs> you may have heard of him, suggested in social learning th theory that there's three key ways that we can bend our identity. Has anyone heard of these? Any ideas? So one of them is experiences, as I suggested with our students. That's a very powerful one. The second is mentors and role models. I didn't put these on here because I want to keep your ears, right? The second is mentors and role models. It turns out we can, our identity is most effectively raised when we have mentors and role models we perceive to be similar to us. So for me as a white male professor, it's important for me to bring in women and people of color as guest speakers or as a professors that I hire for our program because that's who my student body is, right? It's about half women, majority of people of color. So it's important for me to hire people who represent that to role model and create, wow, if they do that, I can do that. I can be a role model for some, but not for all. That's the that feature of our story. None of us can be a role model for everyone, but we can be a role model for someone. <coughs> so experience, mentors, and role models. And then third, this is the sneaky one. Verbal persuasion, nailed it. It's the super, it's free. So those of you working in corporations that are like, we don't have a budget for this, like, hold up, wait a second, CEO, if you give me five minutes, it's free. Speak potential to your employees. And research out of Israel from Dov Eden, about the Pygmalion effect it's called, has found that it raises our identities, our performance by 15 to 16%. They did this with Israeli fighter pilots. Someone who perceived potential, just like that professor did with me in college. Speak potential and say, you are the kind of people that can do great things, you are different. And it raises our performance by 15%. It's even gone to physical ability, weightlifting ability. Isn't that crazy? It changes our bodies, like our anatomy almost, right? When, when people say, you're a person of potential. So every time I hold a microphone, I, I'm immediately, I'm in a position of authority. Anyone that holds a microphone, so I see that as my responsibility. You are people of potential, right? Who, what kind of people come across the country or the world to come and grow themselves, goodness, self-actualize or something, right? To come and grow themselves for two days, to go back. If you are the kind of people that invest that highly in yourselves, how much more so are you the people who speak potential and invest highly in those you're serving? You are so well-equipped and so intentional. What a beautiful group of people. <laughs> the full, you know, American thing, I shall stand here, like I do. Um, right, we hope you've given, we've given you plenty of food for thought. I think you should, do you feel like having a little chat? Yeah. Have a little chat, uh, have a chat for a good quarter of an hour, and just, you know, what of all that makes sense to you, you know, the gender blind thing, the old and crabby thing. The, uh, the how sorry we should feel for employers because they're in a really tough position thing. The you're all great thing. Uh, have a think about those things and then you'll, what I'd like you to do is uh, have a think, have a chat, you know, reflect. And then just on each table, just think of the, whether there are things you want to take up with these guys or you know, things you want to ask the room. We have so much expertise in the room. Off you go.